Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Katya Wald. I'm the executive director here at the MIT Enterprise Forum Cambridge. I'm just going to quickly share my screen here. Um, thanks all for coming to today's uh, presentation. Um, we have uh, four great new startups today presenting um, Bloxo, Botkeeper, um, and I've lost my place. Sorry. Okay. Bloxo, Botkeeper, <laughs> Evenflow Energy, and Proud Poor. Um, you guys should uh, make sure to vote for your favorite after you hear the presentation. Um, I do want to announce um, the Demo Day winner from last week. Um, they won the popular vote. That was Sentinel. They're a decentralized VPN and they offer an encrypted bandwidth network where users can get paid to share or pay to receive bandwidth. So congratulations to them on their win. Um, again, today we have four eight minute presentations. The audience has five minutes to ask questions. Please type your questions in chat. Please also make sure to mute yourself um, when you are uh, on the call um, so that we're only hearing the speaker. Um, also, um, we, will, we are recording this. The recording will be on the website until May 28th um, for voting and the winner will be announced um, at our final demo day, uh, number six on May 29th. Um, you can also connect with the uh, presenters and other folks who've attended um, if you choose to on our Slack channel and, and we'll have everybody post the slides in Slack as well. Um, this is one of many upcoming programs um, that we have. Um, we have one more Startup Spotlight Demo Day. Um, we have an event on um, Canada and Boston um, on quantum computing. We have a cybersecurity launch clinic, and then hopefully, I have my little fingers crossed that we will be able to get together in person on September 14th for our Connected Thing 2020 conference. Um, everything we do here at the Enterprise Forum is supported by our sponsors or our paying members. So if you like what you see here, I do encourage you to either join as a member or um, inquire about sponsorship. And that is my segue to introduce our sponsor for today, which is Morse. Morse has been a sponsor for at least 20 years, I think. Joe ha uh, Martinez has been a wonderful partner and board member of mine for a long time, and I really respect um, working with him. And so I'm gonna introduce Joe. Joe. Hello. There we go. There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, like Katja said, I'm a, on the board of directors of the Enterprise Forum and a partner at Morse Law Firm here in the Boston area. Um, I guess we've definitely been a longtime sponsor of the Enterprise Forum, and we've always tried to be an active participant of the entrepreneurial community here in Boston. Um, for, like Katja said, over 20 years, we've been advising startups, venture backed companies and investors from all kinds of topics ranging from company formation, financing, acquisitions, and everything that happens in between that startup to exit. Um, we've got a pretty really strong intellectual property group that covers patents, trademarks, copyrights, licensing. And we've also got specialists in employment, tax, and litigation matters. Um, we're definitely here for all, all kinds of things that any kind of company or startup or investor could use uh, in, in any um, form. So lastly, I just want to say thank you to uh, Katja and Amy. Um, hopefully, most of you know that Startup Spotlight and most of our events are actually in person or have been, and um, they've pivoted very well into all virtual programming, including the, um, the recent Connected Things Work From Home Edition, and this weekly series of uh, Startup Spotlight um, sessions, demo days. Um, and in the process, we've really broadened the scope, um, as you'll see, uh, not just locally, but international. Um, there's all kinds of folks that are interested in what the Enterprise Forum can do. And um, for anybody new, um, please feel free to become a member. We'd certainly welcome any and all that are interested. Um, so good luck to the, the presenters today and uh, happy, happy Memorial Day weekend, everybody. Thank you, Joe.
I'm going to take it over here really quickly um, and start introducing the presenting companies. And uh, each company gets eight minutes, as we've said before, followed by five minutes of Q&A. Type your questions in chat and Katya will moderate them. Um, the first presenter is Jen from Bloxo. You can share your screen, Jen. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Jennifer and I wanted to tell you about an amazing company today, Bloxo. Bloxo is disrupting the way people organize and participate in recreational sports. I'm going to start today by telling a quick story about the founder, Mabda. So Mabda was actually new to Canada and spoke very little English but loved sports. What he noticed was it was hard to find sports on his schedule, being a full-time student at university as well as having a young child at home. The system was complex and expensive, but he found it hard to commit, and that was actually how Bloxo started. It was one man's vision to bring the world together through physical fitness. So our solution is Bloxo, a SaaS platform that connects people of all backgrounds and ability levels to participate in sports and other activities together by making it simple and easy to organize or join. So one thing we noted is in the sports industry, there were three different aspects that were feeling pain. Participants, organizers, and facilities. The organizers had four different pain points, and we'll kind of go through these quickly. So through our initial customer discovery, we found that organizers felt the most frustration in booking the field. That was that they would spend weeks calling a facility, emails. And I remember when I was going in to do a fitness class with my friends once, we had to book in person. So it spent an hour booking a fitness room for a one hour fitness class. It, it was just crazy. The second is to find players. It can be super time consuming to find enough players to play a sport. If you're looking at, you know, soccer, you need more than five people. And I don't know how many people who aren't me have more than five people that want to play sports with you. So finding players was another kind of big issue that people had tracking down players. So great, you've now found 20 people that want to play the game with you, but what happens when only 10 of them show up? How do you find out who's coming, who isn't coming, and do you have a wait list? Who's managing this? Or the other option is you tell 25 people they can come, and then you get there and 25 people show up. So then you've got the other situation where how are you facilitating this to enable everyone to have the most fun and you personally not to be, you know, frowned upon for either not having enough players or having too many. And then the fourth was payment. So if, for example, only 10 out of the 20 show up, do those people actually now owe a 10th of the payment or still the 20? Are you chasing payments now? And like as a CFO, I'm not going to lie, chasing payments is awful. And I couldn't imagine being an organizer and having to have an AR account. So what we did is with just a few taps of the button, organizers can book facilities, host games, and you have options such as your duration, venue, minimum or maximum players, and so much more. It makes it so seamless and easy for you. Then as an individual, you can log in and you can search by your activity, organizers you follow, leagues that you're part of, what's going on right now, and so much more. So you click the button, you say, I want to play soccer with Mabdu today, and that's it. You've joined, you pay with whatever payment you set up when you set up your profile, and three clicks and you're in a sport. So Bloxo solves the problem for individuals that it's so much easier to find games, systems are more intuitive, and it's flexible, it's on your schedule. So our platform in 2019 had 1,000 new users between November and December. And that was so impressive because our product didn't launch till March 2020. So this was actual organic growth while on our beta platform that users spoke so much about us that we were able to have traction of over 1,500 active users by the end of the year. So this not only was great for us, but it allowed us to understand our customers better and build relationships that may helped make the current version the best one yet. So facilities can also maximize their bookings through the app. And although it's not available right now, we were working on APIs to help integrate to other management software that facilities would use. 
So facilities kept noting to us that they lost revenues and there were inefficiencies within their own bookings. So the size of the market. So essentially, the market in North America is growing year over year of over 20%. And yet there's still very few competitors in the space. And this is a huge market we're talking about here. The actual North America recreational sports market is valued over 33 billion, billion including fitness. So you're probably thinking, oh, that's great. But right now it's not too feasible to have a sport company. And that's another kind of thing that's super exciting. We've started partnering with local yoga studios and not so local fitness classes in the United States to offer virtual as well. We're currently in our beta stage. So as thrilling as this feature I was to add, it does change with every customer feedback and we're expecting to roll this out by mid-June. Although I'm not gonna lie, the developers might give me an earful after this for announcing that live. So our team has been able to work fast and tirelessly in order to make Bloxo virtual reality. We are so lucky to have so many talented, enthusiastic members in our family. We have passionate, diverse team with decades of experience in sports, recreation, facility management, and so much more. Our developers are amazing and able to make changes and updates seamlessly on our app. We at Bloxo believe in our vision and shared values which is to provide people with the opportunity to be involved in recreational fitness opportunities. At Bloxo, we're not just building a company, we're building our community. So we are bringing people together from other communities. We're making sports as easy as three clicks, high value for organizers to drive organic growth and just the growth of physical activity itself. We have been so fortunate to be a part of so many organizations with Bloxo. Volta Labs here in Halifax invited us to do a cohort in 2019, which actually resulted in our very first big check. And when I say big check, I mean like literally big check. So since then, we've been able to secure over $188,000 in non-dilutive funding for Bloxo. So traction. In 2019, we had over 1,500 early adopters on our app. Keep in mind, our product launched in March 2020. We had 70 plus organizers. Over 500 games were organized on our app, and we had seven partnerships locally within universities, fitness, sports, recreation. One more minute. So what can you do for us? Well, what we'd love from anyone who's watching, whether it's just a shout out to us, liking us on social media, new users joining our app, funding or partnership, we are so happy to hear from you. If you're an organizer or a fitness instructor, we'd love to have you directly connect with us as we're always looking for more beta testers or for client discovery. So that is my time today. I could talk about blocks, so believe me, a lot more. So if we go over time for questions, feel free to email any one of us from our website, connect with us on our social media page. And that's it. Thanks, Jan. Appreciate it. We have a ton of questions coming in. So oh, wow. I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm going to try to read them in order. Um, so is this a regional play? Um, and what are you planning on doing for a geographical rollout? So currently we're looking at getting our first hundred um, organizers on board in Nova Scotia and from there we're working kind of towards uh, we've got plans to move into the United States in 2021 um, originally it was actually this year but I don't think that's possible anymore now what's interesting with the virtual though is it can be anywhere so as I mentioned like one of our fitness um, partners is actually based in Miami so they're putting their classes online people can pay through our app and the money goes directly to them. So with virtual, it's actually less of a regional play and more of just kind of an online marketplace. Whereas the in location, we do realize that it's gonna take some time to set up, um, meet with organizers, talk to different cities and kind of get everything on board. Um, facilities have been kind of the biggest, uh, biggest piece of that puzzle too, because as soon as like facilities kind of get on board and people realize that that's easier then we can kind of move some of the other but it all works so together that, you know, if we had the clients, then we could get the facilities. If we had the organizers, we could get the clients. And so. Great. 
Um, so I think you sort of were getting this, but can you talk a little bit about dealing with the two-sided market problem, sort of attracting people on both <laughs> sides? Uh, perfect segue. That's apparently yeah. what I'm great at. Yeah. Um, so essentially what we've noticed is the easiest way to kind of find out what the end user wants was just to talk to the end users. So we ended up having a lot of end users simply because that's who we talked to. We wanted to know what made them want to come to their app, our app, what other options they had used before and customer discovery on that. Now, when looking at the marketplace, the kind of piece of the puzzle that's not used as often um, is the facilities. So the facilities are the behemoth. Um, so by focusing on organizers and participants, a lot of the organizers are participants and some of the participants want to be organizers. So it ends up being the same market, even though it's not. Interesting. Um, so there's a question here about the, you know, the million dollar question, what's the revenue model? And what's so, the total addressable market? So the revenue is subscription. So we are a script subscription model. So essentially organizers, clubs would pay us money to be on our application. So if you choose the freemium model, uh, you can have up to four games per month, but there is a service charge if you're charging any of your players. Okay. So that, that's how we're making money is yes, we are charging people. Okay, what's, um, the, roll out, the, what's the rollout and the sales and marketing strategy for that? So currently our virtual is planning to be up online in mid-June and we've got our entire sales team. So we hired four sales associates um, that are actually doing the rollout right now. So they're starting to do, we're going to do a hard launch. Um, so right now they're kind of working on what that looks like, how we're doing that and social media. And that was another thing of just having, having people connect with us on social media makes it that much easier to get that reach out for when we're doing that launch. Um, as for the in-person sports, um, the rollout for that kind of seems ever changing. We got news here in Nova Scotia that non-contact sports are allowed to be picked back up in June. So if that actually goes through, that makes that a lot easier. Uh, if it doesn't, then we're probably going to have to keep pushing things back and back and back. Okay. Um, I think I probably have time for one more question. Right. So I'm going to, okay. Um, are your per current participants, I think you said 1,500 paying customers and what percentage is your repeated customer from the entire cohort? Ah, so I have actually a really cool network graph that I totally want to show you right now um, where I've graphed every one of our, our end users to every game that they've played and the more the bigger their node is, the bigger the circle is so that I actually could see this information. So what was interesting with the beta testers that we had at the end of 2019 is 98% of them were repeat users. So now you do have to keep in mind that that is not going to be accurate as soon as we had our actual launch and go through this is 98% is not feasible. We're looking at more of a 60% retention rate uh, just based on kind of talking to people. And the other kind of issue with our sample group was here in Nova Scotia, there was no other option. So whereas when you go to Toronto, there's a few other options. There's some different competitors in the States. So we, we would be crazy to think that we're going to have such a high retention rate then. But by talking to the customers, we've been able to know. So we had some features that we obviously thought everyone wanted, which was false, um, like probably most, most startups. So like our MVP ended up being more of what the end user told us than what we had thought that people wanted, um, which worked out really well for us for our customer retention. And the second part of that question, I'm sorry, what was that? No, I think um, we're, out we're out of time. Out of time. <laughs> so, so we're, we're okay. But thank you. Um, I do want to say um, for those of you who asked questions who, who didn't get those answers, you can go on the Slack channel and just make sure that you guys connect with these folks. All right. Next up, we have Kirsten from Botkeeper. So thank you everyone for joining today. I'm going to try to keep this eight minutes as interesting for you all as I can. Um, my name is Kirsten. I am a product marketing manager at Botkeeper which is an automated bookkeeping solution that helps CPA firms and their clients grow. So to give you a little background, um, our company was founded in 2015 by our CEO who actually had experienced his own bad bookkeeping, which almost made him lose his first startup. 
Um, we've received two rounds of funding to date, one notably by Google's AI team. And today we have about 100 counting firms using our product and about 1,000 small business owners. We're headquartered right here in Boston, Mass, but we have a presence kind of all over the map. So I can start off by confidently telling you there are a few problems in the accounting industry when it comes to bookkeeping. There's inefficiencies in traditional bookkeeping comes with this big tidal wave of even bigger issues. Limited reporting, poor data accuracy, frequent bookkeeping turnover, and so on. For accountants, bookkeeping is far too often the barrier to scale and grow their firms. It's hard to find and hire the right bookkeepers and even harder to retain them. And with each bookkeeper turnover, there's a loss in knowledge, a direct impact on customers, and it usually forces the firm's partners to fill in the gaps until they can find a replacement. Along with the existing turnover issues, accountants are also presented with hundreds of different tools to string together into bookkeeping and accounting machines. And while all the tools are out there serve great purposes, I'm sure very few accountants went into their career field hoping to be systems integrators. With multiple tools comes data loss, information slipping between the cracks, challenges with employee adoption, and a delicate infrastructure. Plus, there's this really big looming talent supply and demand problem in the industry. And what we've seen is that the industry is pretty flat, which means finding and hiring quality bookkeepers is really difficult to find. Without the volume numbers entering the workforce in the space, it's more and more challenging every day to replace folks who transition out of the firm and then keep them there. So I bet you're wondering where does Botkeeper fit in? Why do we set out to automate bookkeeping in the first place? I'm sure you're sitting at the edge of your seat asking what exactly is Botkeeper? In short, Botkeeper is a combination of amazing technology and highly skilled accountants. Our solutions use AI, ML, RPA, robotic process automation, to automate the majority bookkeeping work that prevents firms from scaling, diversifying their offerings, and focus on skill sets where it matters most. Our human team swoops in, we handle the complex bookkeeping or accounting tasks, apply critical thinking where needed, and help to train the machines to become better and more efficient. The results, better, faster, and more efficient bookkeeping for CPA firms and their clients. With that comes time recouped, money saved, and the potential to significantly grow. So we found that there is a spectrum of technology usage in the landscape. As we're seeing the difficult shift in process over the last few months during the COVID-19 era, the accounting industry is really just starting to embrace AI, ML, and so on, falling a bit behind a lot of other industries. All the while, venture-backed cloud or AI accounting firms like Pilot and Scale Factor are using their millions of dollars for sales and marketing to position themselves as an all-in-one solution, a one-stop shop, only, not only for bookkeeping, but tax work, advisory, CFO, and so on. So those who aren't adopting technology are quickly becoming left behind and are having a lot of challenges differentiating themselves from near identical alternatives. So the result is a landscape that looks something kind of similar to this. The venture cloud-backed firms, the traditional in-house processors that result in traditional issues, as well as a Franken system approach. And then there's Botkeeper. So how does the Botkeeper process actually work? What you're seeing in front of you is effectively how the data flows into Botkeeper, how it's automated, and how it improves. When data flows into our system, models are applied using everything we've learned from thousands of clients along with macro data. Our humans are looped in to verify and review, and then the system learns and improves as the cycles repeat. And you might be wondering how the tech knows what to do. How do they handle the unique client data? How, how it compares to some of the auto categorization and AI out there today? So Botkeeper has this unique to market accuracy. When clients' information comes in our system, the more data they have, the higher our accuracy level will be upon their first pass. But even when a client comes in our system with nothing, just getting started, our models are able to achieve a 63% accuracy upon first pass. Our human team then enriches and improves the data from there ensuring the utmost accuracy before going to our client for approval and our system to continues to get more accurate over time. 
This means quicker uptime in terms of training with no risk of information being forgotten or lost, resulting in significantly less time taken from our clients so they can focus on running their businesses. And let's start with the software. Here's a snapshot of some of the tools and the partner platform that we offer. As you see, there are a variety of features to help consolidate processes into one place while innovating. Everything you need under one cloud-based platform that automates, acts as a secure document sharing, easy communicates between you and us, and there's a ton more. And then on the service side, well, it's a bit of an overlap between tech and service, but of course, we perform the bookkeeping. As you've seen, the technology and the humans work together doing what they do best. And to that, that, our ability to integrate with hundreds of software tools and over 16,000 bank and credit card institutions. And lastly, we provide a great playbook so we know what to do when we need to do it. And here's just a quick snapshot of just some of our integrations, which I'm sure people know, ADP, Gusto, T-Sheets, Bill.com. So at a glance, the Botkeeper solution offers the following platform ecosystem. All of the bookkeeping, so top to bottom, along with hundreds of software connections. Firms and businesses are able to run on One our minute. platform, providing their clients with amazing services, as well as an awesome financial hub that you can log into and grab data. Just a little quick behind the scenes look, our artificial intelligence and machine learning are being powered by some amazing class machine learning architecture from Amazon Web Services, Python, Flask, and more. We know we have power for, to very sensitive information, so our security is always top priority. We don't use bank logins, encrypted data. We encrypt the data. We're working on getting our SOC 2 type 1 attested credit shortly. And these are just some testimonials from our, some of our partners. And our setup process is world class. We offer a great white glove onboarding service. And I bet you're wondering how you learn more or how do you want to learn more about BotKeeper? Here is our contact information. Thank you so much. Um, welcome. So I have a question because um, I see a few questions coming in, but um, I've seen you guys um, over the last couple of years and it looks like you've pivoted to um, accounting firms. And so can you just kind of walk through you know, th that pivot if you can and, and where, because I think you started actually serving small businesses, right? Correct, and we still do serve small businesses. Um, we have pivoted a bit more towards a CPA firm, and so they bring in their clients, so we're still kind of getting those direct businesses. Um, what we're noticing is that our CPA firms can actually help the businesses that we serve. So by creating this model where, yes, Botkeeper can directly service businesses, or we can refer to one of our great CPA partners that's using our platform. So we do service both, but yes, our focus has been on CPA firms. Okay. Um, I have a question here on how long it takes to set up a new customer. Sure. So if it's a small business setup, um, it, it depends. It, it definitely depends on how your books look. So if your books are clean, it's a bit easier. Um, if you're on QuickBooks desktop and we need to migrate you to QuickBooks online, that takes some time. We also do migrations. So the I don't know the exact number of days. Um, I would say a typical process is maybe under 30 days. Great. Um, so who are your competitors with similar technology and how do you protect the data privacy of your clients? I think you, you did go over that. Um, and then the other, this is like a four part question. Um, how much data do you need to train your data? Um, is, and is that completed as of now? Sure. Um, so some of our competitors, um, they're not exactly in line because they don't really service the CPA firms like we do. They're much more focused on the small business side. Um, but I would say, obviously, Pilot, I mentioned, Scale Factor, um, Bench a bit. So those, those are our, probably our competitors. Um, our AI is constantly learning. So we're not a set data set. We actually learn as we go. So you bring on all of your um, bookkeeping needs and we learn if we can't we don't get it right the first time we actually reach out to you we say you know how should this be categorized so that in the future all of the categorization is correct right um, um, and then in security I think I did cover a bit but you know we have encryption uh, two-factor authentication we use AWS okay um, what's your future funding strategy 
Sure. Um, so we have done two rounds of funding so far, um, both in 2018. Um, I think our team is right now meeting and deciding what we want to do next. Great. Um, there's a question here about um, the number of customers you have and the number of sort of repeat customers you have. Sure. So as I said, we have about 100 accounting firms on our platform and a, a couple thousand businesses on our platform. So it is a monthly subscription. So we do have continuous monthly subscriptions. Um, we've had people on our platform since, you know, 2016. Great. Um, and what's the total addressable market? I do not know that answer off the top of my head, but I'm happy to get back to whoever asked the question. Okay, great. Um, Amy, do I have time for more questions? One more. All right. Um, let's see. What's your go forward sales and marketing strategy? Our go forward sales and marketing strategy. Um, so obviously it is to be a thought leader in the space. I am obviously on the marketing team. Um, we're really working to be thought leaders, work on white papers. We're really big into blogs. So if anyone would like to join our blog, we put out about three blogs a week. Um, we're working with thought leaders. Um, Jody Padar, who is known as the Radical CPA, recently joined our firm. So definitely trying to be top in the market to bring, bring interesting content being relevant for what's happening around COVID-19 and how the industry is shifting more towards AI and ML. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask one more <laughs> quick question. What's your next major milestone for the company? Sure. Uh, so we're actually working a lot around our platform and the performance of it and how to make it the best possible experience. So a lot of it is being spent on that and we're continuing to refine our AI and ML to be even better. Although we have wonderful accuracy rates now, um, we recently hired someone who's going to make it even better. And I think there's a huge focus around that. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. Thank you so thank much you. for having me. All right. Next up, we have Kurt from Evenflow Energy. Um, hey guys, <laughs> uh, so my name is Kurt with Evenflow Energy, obviously, uh, just been announced. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about what myself and my business partner have been working on for the last, uh, you know, since 2019. So, you know, new venture here. Um, so, you know, I, I'll, I'll make it a little bit personal, um, the backstory here. Uh, so, you know, 10 years ago, I was uh, riding around Europe on a bike and uh, ended up in a Tesla showroom in Monte Carlo and was just absolutely blown away by this car. I'm not even a car guy, but it just totally spoke to me. And I, I, I didn't even realize electric cars were a thing yet. Um, so, you know, but at that time I realized, you know, I really want to be in this space. I want to have something to do with it. It's really interesting. And uh, so flash forward, you know, now it's 2020. But as of 2019, you can see that, you know, Electric vehicles, uh, sales of electric vehicles are a thing now. Um, 330,000 of them sold in the US just last year. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance has that number going up to 1.6 million in the next five years. Um, there'll be a little bit of a dip uh, because of COVID, you can see in the graph there, but um, I think they expect it to be off by about 23%, but uh, you know, sort of climbing out of that, that, that valley relatively quickly. Um, the reason I'm here, the reason I have a you know a pitch here, is basically these two quotes: one from Tesla and one from uh, Bloomberg New Energy. Uh, the best charging experience will always be to charge at home, plug in when you get home, and wake up to a full charge. Uh, Bloomberg buyers with access to home charging will go electric at a much faster rate than those without. Uh, my business partner and I have been uh, sort of designing, selling car charging systems uh, for the last few years. And, and we sort of saw a, a, an opportunity uh, where there was just an underserved marketplace. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the problem now. Um, so one in 10 new owners of, a, of an EV needs to upgrade their electrical service in their, in their basement uh, to the tune of thousands of dollars because you know, there's just not enough electricity, uh, or excuse me, there's, there's not enough, uh, there's too much, electricity going through that, 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 that electrical infrastructure, that, that, that circuit breaker panel. Um, you know, these homes just weren't made for, for someday potentially adding another 25 to 50% of demand uh, through that infrastructure. Um, so, you know, to that end, my business partner and I have come up with a device called the Evenflow Energy Router. 
And what it does is it allows pre-existing electric loads like an oven or a dryer or an air conditioning condenser uh, to share a circuit breaker with an EV charging station. Um, it, it, it's a pretty slick device and you can see the 2020 National Electric Code has actually recognized you know, these, these products. Uh, the, the National Electric Code, I should say, is the, um, it is the body uh, that electricians and uh, electrical inspectors sort of go to for, for reference and for you know, guidance as far as you know, what, what products are out there that they can install. Um, so that said, um, I seem to, there we go. Um, so that said, our device obviates the need for these costly upgrades. And then in, in developing this product, what we also found is that, um, you know, it can also significantly reduce the amount of wires that need to go into a car charger install. Um, so if the load you're happening to be integrating with is, you know, on the path of, of you know, between the panel and the car charger, and now you're just reusing those existing wires or multi-using them for the dryer as well as the car charger. Um, this is particularly effective in a condo or apartment. You can see in this illustration here, uh, if you've got a shared utility space that you're not even allowed to go into anyway, so even if you wanted to upgrade these, your, 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 your uh, electric panel, you can't even get into that space. And the reason being that if you're you know, a condo association, the bylaws will literally say, uh, unless there's enough physical space to upgrade, uh, you know, your service or the service for everyone, um, then no one can do it. Uh, it's just inherently not fair if they do it any other way. Um, but beyond that, what's really interesting is the idea that you're actually installing that car charger with such little new wiring. So you're saving all that wiring through a building that's, you know, a commercial building, possibly a, a, a multi-dwelling unit. Um, so it, it's in addition to not having to do these upgrades, you're also getting the benefit of the wiring. Um, if you happen to have a air conditioning unit near your parking area, uh, you could virtually not even step inside the house to, to put something in like this. So um, that, that's sort of down the road. But um, as far as the market segment, we expect 10% of all new EV owners could potentially use this instead of a complete upgrade. Um, if we were to capture 25% of that market, uh, 2019 revenues would have been $5 million. Uh, 2020 revenues at a 23% drop because of COVID would uh, equate to 3.75. And you know, by 2025, we'd be looking at potentially 24 million revenue. Uh, the total addressable market for EVs, you've got 15 million cars or vehicles sold in the U.S. every year. You get 275 uh, million vehicles on the road that eventually will be electrified. And you know, you're looking at, at legislation coming out of Europe that suggests that that's gonna uh, happen even quicker. Um, you know, that, that's actually a pretty significant target market for us. Um, we imagine that you know, higher labor rates coupled with older stone buildings is gonna make uh, wiring that much more difficult. Uh, and we see that the EU market will grow faster than the US. Um, as far as competition, there are a few manufacturers out there doing something similar to us. Um, one's a do-it-yourself sort of product. There's another company that man manufactures a product that's significantly expensive or more expensive. Um, I should say that only the Evenflow can deliver that minimal wiring feature that I spoke so uh, significantly about. So uh, we've been working with folks down at the Clean Tech Open here at the MIT Enterprise Forum. And uh, at this point, the product's been bootstrapped. It's fully listed and insured, and we're market ready. Um, COVID's obviously thrown us a bit of a curveball. So at this point, we're looking to you know, develop some strategic partners with partnerships with larger corporations or nimble manufacturing startups that could possibly uh, assist in product iteration. Um, myself and my business partner, we've sort of been in this space for a number of years. Uh, I can talk, tell you a little bit about my own personal uh, experience having worked for an electrical device One manufacturer minute. in sales, uh, both here in the US and internationally. Uh, and then, you know, most, uh, most importantly, serial entrepreneur working on a couple of different projects throughout the years. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's the, that's the, that's it in a nutshell. So great. Questions? Thank, thank you, Kurt. Um, I just want to say, Kurt, you, Kurt's been around the enterprise forum for a long time and I'm, I'm thrilled to see sort of 
all the fruits of your labor. So congratulations for that. Um, so there's a question here on um, more of a question and a statement. So the, is the reason why EV are a small percentage of total sales, is it the electric install cost at home? And then are people who live in a building with charge with charging, do they buy EVs at a much higher rate? Um, generally speaking, uh, the, the reason that the market is not as significant for electric vehicles today is because they tend to be, uh, you know, it's premium technology. Um, you know, you're looking at uh, someone that might buy a Model 3 would possibly be looking at for $35,000, might possibly be looking at a Honda Accord for $25,000 as an alternative. But they'll make that reach because they're doing something that they in, to just believe in as far as the mission statement, uh, you know, electrifying transportation. Um, and, and, you know, you look at the, the, the numbers, it can be competitive when you look at, you know, the cost of gasoline and how much you might save if you're just charging a car instead of filling it up with gasoline. Um, so there's a couple of, you know, factors that go into why people choose a gasoline engine car over uh, an electric car today. Um, but they, you know, the, the, the research shows that the costs have uh, come down so substantially over the last 10 years since, you know, uh, electric cars just started to creep into the marketplace uh, that, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a slippery or a slowly at first and all at once is sort of where I imagine the adoption of electric cars or the, the rate of electric cars. And I think we're right at that all at once sort of moment. Um, so uh, I, I'm sorry, what was the second second part of that? Uh, so people question? who live in a building with oh, charging, yeah. to, are Correct. they buying EVs at a much higher rate? Yeah, well, I mean, if you just look at the demographics of people that live in like, you know, Somerville, Cambridge, uh, you know, so, uh, South Boston, et cetera, um, they, they certainly have the, uh, and I'm just speaking Boston centric here, but you know, you can imagine that those similar communities across the world. Um, but they certainly would have the interest in going electric if they could. But if you have a shared utility space and you know, all the headaches, anyone that's ever lived in a condo building that's tried to have like solar installed, for example, or something like that knows the headaches of, of just trying to get a condo association to move forward with anything. And if you can avoid that, that, that you know, um, the hassle of working with, you know, someone that, that you have to seek permission from to, to make that happen, um, you know, all the better. Um, so. I have a question here about the MSRP of the unit, um, your margins, cost of goods, and your current status. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've got the product, um, you know, sort of ready to launch. COVID-19 has obviously sort of changed the game for us a little bit. Um, so we're, we're sort of looking to potentially adapt to, you know, the new normal, as, as people say. Um, the, the, you know, we have ideas for iterations for, you know, something that could, um, you know, be significantly more um, advantageous to the installing electrician. Uh, you know, so we can sort of envision an iteration that we would love to, uh, you know, put forth into the world. Uh, but for the fact that we are a bootstrap company and, you know, uh, that, that's another level of sophistication that we'd have to uh, evolve the company into. So, um, uh, so right. as far as the MSRP, uh, if you go on our website, it, it's out there right now. So it, it, it's for sale, but it's sort of, you know, soft launch type of thing. Uh, you know, we're not sort of, uh, uh, we're refining our strategy at this point. Yes. So. Right. Um, there's a question here um, about, do you have a vision for how your solutions may work with home electric solutions like energy storage, solar, wind at mm -hmm. all? Yeah. Um, Sorry, so, we're almost out of time. So just yeah. you can quickly. Yeah, the, <laughs> the quick answer to that is that uh, I've had several conversations with several people that are sort of in that space and they've identified, uh, you know, holes in the market that we could easily fill. So I'll, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. All right. There are a bunch of questions that came in that I wasn't able to get to. So again, folks, if you have questions for Kurt, uh, make sure you join the Slack channel or um, let us know and we can connect you.
Excellent. Thank Great. you. Guys. Thanks, Kurt. All right. Uh, the fourth presenter is Brian from Proud Poor. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Brian Thurber. I'm the CEO of Proud Poor. We are an eco alcohol company that helps fund the work of 22 environmental nonprofits across the US. Uh, we do have a tech component that I'll talk about at the end that's part of our future roadmap. Uh, let's see. There we go. Um, so we have four beverages in the market right now. Each one is tied to a specific cause. So on the left is our Sauvignon Blanc, uh, that's Mendocino County, and it supports wild oyster reef restoration, including in six sites in New England. And uh, we've restored 12 million oysters to date. The next one is our Oregon Pinot Noir for the bees. So it supports bee habitat planting on farms across the US, and we've done 74 acres of restoration so far. The next is our Cider for Sea Turtles, uh, we launched last summer. That supports uh, sea turtle hospitals, including New England Aquarium. And then the Rosé for Reefs, we're very excited about. We launched it uh, with perfect timing uh, about a couple weeks ago. It's a lovely Russian River Valley um, Pinot Noir Rosé. And just to give you a sense of what the pricing on all these, uh, so at Whole Foods, you would pay $18 for the Sauvignon Blanc, about $20 for the Pinot Noir, $12 for a four pack of the cider, and 13 for the uh, rosé. And for just to give you a sense of the business model, uh, so we work with sustainable winemakers on the West Coast, and then we buy the wine from them, bottle it under our brand, and sell it to distributors in all of our states. So we have 15 distributors. They're actually the entities that then sell it to the shops and restaurants. And then we give back 5% uh, of our top line revenue to those 22 environmental partners. So these are all nonprofits. And that's about 5x the typical give back company. Most are at about 1% of revenue, even when they peg it to profits. So uh, we're Cambridge based. We've been doing this about five years and we're 100% bootstrapped. So it's just two of us. Um, so myself, I have a law and environment background and my business partner, Berlin Kelly, she has a finance and fermentation background. Uh, we've built out a pretty nice footprint um, so we're in all the states that you see in dark blue, uh, the states in, in light blue, some of which we were going to bite off this year, but we're going to push that to next year. Uh, we're in pre-COVID, we're in about 750 shops and restaurants around the country, um, just with a lot of shoe leather, a lot of work on our parts. Um, we probably, luckily we're a retail focused brand. Uh, we, we lost probably 50 accounts just from restaurants going out of business, but we still have a pretty solid um, base of sales. And just to give you a sense of scale, so we've sold 180,000 bottles of our Saw Blanc and Pinot Noir and about 5,000 four packs of the Cider for Sea Turtles and the Rosé just launched. Um, and then last year we did uh, $450,000 in revenue. And that's, you know, no employees, basically zero marketing spend. That's almost, an, uh, no sales reps, we, you know, we have no one on the ground in New York, nothing like that. So that's um, basically Instagram and word of mouth that does that. So there's been just great energy out there. We were actually on track to do about 600,000 in sales this year, but that, that's probably gonna be flat because of COVID. And so the energy, you know, who we're reaching, um, we just had this confirmed, what we already kind of knew by a survey. It's more than half of our uh, most dedicated fans are women aged 25 to 34. Um, so we really reach millennials and it's not really much of a surprise. It's a more values focused generation. 90% uh, of them say they would uh, switch to a brand that has a social mission. Um, actually 70% say they would pay more for it as well. Um, you know, the problem we're solving for them, it's always funny when you have this kind of give back consumer product to talk about, you know, what's the problem you solve? There's, there's two problems we've, we've learned of from our interviews with consumers. What are we really doing for them? One is there is just a values alignment thing where we, by purchasing our wines, they're sustainable, they help this great environmental work and they're good wines. Um, they feel like they're making a good choice. The other that's much more interesting is they use our wines as a sort of badge. It's like Patagonia. Um, for many environmentalists. It's a way of showing other people what you care about. 
our fans widely report bringing these to parties, for example, and showing their friends and it starts a conversation. They just have a great experience with that. Um, and it, what's interesting is, is buyers at the retail store level also seem to recognize that there's what we're tapping into. Uh, so a recent example is last year, we launched an experiment in Illinois uh, where we launched with a distributor that had no sales presence, no sales force. And we have no sales presence anywhere. So um, the question is, how do you get it onto shelves? So what I did was I called every single Whole Foods in Illinois, so that's I think 27 Whole Foods, and I believe it was 16 or 17 of the buyers said yes to buying the wines without meeting anyone or without tasting the wines even. Um, as far as I understand, you know, this is just unheard of in the industry um, when you're a no-name brand like we are. None of the buyers knew who we were because um, we hadn't been in Illinois before. So that just gives you a sense of the energy that's out there for this. Now, until recently, despite that amazing energy that we get super fans, no doubt, um, we struggled a bit with product market fit. Um, the wines were staying in accounts. They were just selling slower than we knew they should be selling. And we think we fixed that with the rosé. We, we talked to a lot of fans and it was clear that for millennials paying 18 bucks for a Sauvignon Blanc and 20 bucks for a Pinot Noir is a lot. Um, and so this is our first sub $15 wine. You know, we've only had it in the market a week and a half, two weeks, but we've already gotten some early indications of how good this, this is gonna be. Uh, so we've had three accounts reorder that also carry the Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. And it's, they're now selling the rosé, even during the chilly weather we've been having, um, they're selling the rosé at 4x to 10x the typical sales velocity for the other wines. So that's, that's pretty exciting for us. Um, so let me just talk really briefly, my last slide about our, our sort of future vision. So we're, we're going to keep on releasing new products. Our fans just love it. So next year, we're going to do a Grenache for Grey Wolves. We're going to do a Chardonnay for Sharks. Um, the year after that, we'll do a Syrah for Soil and a, a Merlot for, um, for Monarchs. And that's great. There's also an element where we know that a give back company is just a Band-Aid for the planet, right? I mean, that's... I have an environmental background. I know that this requires systemic change. We're really convinced from talking to our fans that the big play here for having an incredible impact One is, minute. thank you, um, is to be able to essentially arm our fans with storytelling tools, ways to help them talk to their friends about these important narratives about the environment. So these will be technology-enabled storytelling tools. Um, next year, we were looking at something for this year, but uh, as with everyone, COVID's kind of changed things. Next year, we plan to launch our first augmented reality experiences so that it's very easy and seamless for friends to talk about what they, um, why they care about this wine, why they're excited about it. Um, that gets at the last piece, which is us being bootstrapped. Um, bootstrapping in wine is incredibly difficult because the production cycles are about a year. So you just end up hoarding every dollar of your margin to be able to buy more wine the next time. It's brutal. Um, so we're definitely going to have to take a check um, at some point in the next year for the first time. Um, so that's something, you know, if, if people want to talk, talk to us, please reach out. Um, if you have friends you think would be interested, we're just starting to have those conversations to try to find the right fit um, for someone who's interested in you know, our product, our mission, all that. So very interested to hear your questions. Great. Um, thank you so much. Um, there's a question here about, um, I think you covered sort of the price point um, question. That came in as soon as you started talking about the $15 rosé. Um, but uh, after that, it was, what's the typical order um, amount and what's the time to reorder? Yeah, so our distributors will order anything from a half pallet, which is 28 cases, to, you know, two pallets, which is 112 cases. And then at the store or restaurant level, you know, we had a restaurant, our best account was a restaurant in New York that's probably going to be out of business that was ordering 10 cases a week. That's wow. an incredible amount of wine. That's 120 bottles a week. Now, that's, that's an outlier. You know, typical order will be anywhere from one to five cases. And it really depends. You know, we have Whole Foods that order three cases every few weeks. And we have accounts that really order 
a case every three to five months and they love it. I mean, they're just a little boutique wine shop. They have a few fans who totally connect with us. And it's a big variation. Right. Sorry that, of course, the cleaning people arrived and they're vacuuming right out, outside my door. So if you all can hear that, I apologize. Um, I have a question here on, is this a lifestyle company and how do you plan on exiting? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of paths forward. I, we 100% could be, you know, helming this in 10 years. Um, I think that this is only exciting if it grows really significantly. You know, it's, it's, it inspires our fans because they care about the planet. They want big solutions. They want big things to happen. And it's the same for us. So this is not something where I think we're interested in staying you know, below a million in revenue or anything like that. I think this is only exciting if it really has an impact. Great. Um, there's a question here, how you find the store that sells your wine right now? Oh, sorry, I missed the first part you cut out. Um, how does one find a store that sells your wine? Oh, yeah. So our website, proudpour.com, has a map um, that you can just sort of click, use my current location. It shows you all the nearest places. And then we do have a retail shop in New York, and it's set various ones that will ship direct to consumer. This one ships to 43 states. So on our website, on the where to buy page, there's a buy online button in the upper right-hand corner, so you can ship it almost anywhere. Sorry, you cut out for me, but hopefully. Um... Yeah, there's, there's a map on our website at proudpour.com and there's a buy online button in the upper right-hand corner that takes you to a place where you can ship. Awesome. Um, we are out of time, but there's a bunch of other questions. Um, again, for everybody who um, didn't get a chance to ask a question, please post it on the Slack channel. Um, these folks should, will be available to answer them. Um, I put the link to vote um, in this chat. We'll also send you guys a follow-up um, as well. Um, make sure you vote. Make sure you tell your friends to vote. Um, we'll have the video up on the site. Um, thank you all for presenting. Thanks to Morse for supporting us and sponsoring this in, in our pivot um, to go from an in-person event to virtual. And um, next week is the last one. So everybody register for next week with Wolf Greenfield. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Have a great long weekend.